Hello and welcome to the Lawrence Plays channel for another Factorio Space Exploration Crestorio 2 update video. And in today's video, we're going to take a bit of a look at um, what Mike's been doing with the uh, with the with the Arcosphere, um, well, with the the Arcosphere project, shall we say? The first thing he's done is put in a, a, a machine over here to make the Arcosphere collectors, and these are a base, these are essentially probes like many many of the other ones. So in ages ago we made the solar probes and the asteroid belt probes. Then later on I made the the uh, deep space probes, these ones over here, the interstellar void probes even. And now uh, Mike has made the Arcosphere collectors. And what that does it it takes in dynamic emitters, processors, uh, cubes, uh, 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 and antimatter canisters, laser turrets, and it makes one of those. And it gives you back the magnetic canister as well, which is very kind of it so you can take that background re refill it with the antimatter and reuse it again so that's that's lovely and as you can see we've got the uh, we've got the he's done quite a lot of the loading here by bots where uh, where required uh, so he's got a he's got a couple of trains coming in here though that are bringing in the quantum processors and the naquium cubes because those are already available on the train system so it's better to do that than to use the bots um, and those are coming over from well the, the quantum processors are being made somewhere in energy science over here the naquium cubes are being made in deep space science over here and chucked onto the belt goes over here loads the train up so there's a there's a plentiful supply of those so you shouldn't shouldn't run out of those for at least a little while some of the other things are in the right area as well so we've got the um, the, the the aeroframe bulkheads are being brought in already for something else, uh, as are the laser turrets, so those could be passed into here. But unfortunately, that still means there's a couple of other things required, so we still need the dynamic emitters and the antimatter canisters. I couldn't tell you where the dynamic emitters are being made. I have a feeling it might be on the tower of construction, I'm not sure. But the antimatter canisters, as you can see, are being brought in by um, by, by uh, logistics robot. And though, and we need, but we need 10 of those before we can actually uh, make an arcosphere collector. So they're really, really expensive. But as I say, they're being brought in gradually. And in the interest of yak shaving, that meant that we needed to be producing the antimatter faster than we were. So we've got these machines over here that are, in theory, producing antimatter. But as you can see, only about half of them are running at the moment. In fact, now less than a then, then they're not all running, and the problem with these, I believe, is is down to the well. It was down to the uh, the thermofluid being brought in. Okay, now it's due to getting rid of the um, of the warm thermofluid. That's even more ridiculous. But pre previously, we had a problem with the uh, cold thermofluid being brought in, and so some upgrades have been done up here. But there's there's still obviously a little bit more work needs to be done. There was some expansion of all of the radiators and hypercoolers. So these have been we've had put in had a few more of these put in, and they've got beacons in there and things like that now. Um, and also, but also I came along and I put in these these pumps all the way along here so it's pump pipe pump pipe pump pipe and so on and, and that managed to boost the uh, the rate we're bringing the warm stuff out of these um out of these hypercoolers down back down into the tank over here up to a significant be run significantly faster and it looks like this tank has now filled up because of that so what we're going to need to do is put in another tank there maybe two more tanks there i'm not sure and then link all of these together with red cables because at the moment the theory is that we've got these tanks over here that are brought over from where the thermofluid is produced and then they keep this tank topped up and to make sure that it's it's always got at least a little bit in it so we can continue to chill it to turn it into the cold to turn it into the very very sorry turn it into the cooled turn it into the cold turn it into the super cooled and so it, because thermofluid gradually degrades so as you when you when you when you run it through here you only get back most of what you put into it so you see 500 goes in 499 comes out so you do need a steady feed of it to be brought back in but you also need to have enough space in this in this uh, tank to make sure that you can you can dispose of any warm stuff that's being produced by all your machines downstream and so that's why we're getting a problem now so when this arrives like dupe that and that I can now put in the cables here to make sure we don't bring any inadvertently bring any more through on the pump over here and there's now plenty of room for this to this this pump to start running and that's going to pull all of the excess warm thermofluid out of these um, machines down here so now you can see they're all running they're all producing antimatter and that means we can run out run the antimatter out here and there's presumably an anti well, there's an antimatter train down there but i guess yes down here there is a machine putting antimatter into canisters and this worked quite nicely because we already have a supply of the magnetic canisters over here to make the ion canisters that are used to go into this science pack so so tapping it off here makes a lot of sense. We've got the antimatter over here as well. So these, this is where they're being produced. They're being put into the uh, into the red chest here, and then taken away to be turned into the um, in, into the arcosphere collectors. After all of what I was saying yesterday, I have been thinking though that I'd like to redesign this completely and stop using this sort of pipe pump pipe pump thing and start using the uh, and start using the ductings. So I could perhaps have the uh, so, so I could have a little clump of uh, of radiators and a clump of um, hypercoolers, and then bring the uh, bring the various types of coolant in and out as, as required using the ducts rather than uh, rather than just using these long long pipes because the eventually as you, as you saw with this one the long pipes just start to struggle a bit and 
yeah, it's it's just not it's it's not good enough. So I think doing it with ducts would be would be better. It'll probably be quite a lot bigger. I might need to expand upwards a little bit, but there's plenty of room to do that. And I think it's worth it. It'll make the system a bit more modern. And I can also start putting in the uh, the full the wide area beacons instead of these little tiny little crappy beacons as well. So that'll make that that'll be a big improvement for that one. That means over here we are making we are making the coolant in order to, and in order to, and to make the antimatter to make the antimatter canisters. The antimatter canisters are taken over to here to be made into the arcosphere collectors. Then the arcosphere collectors are being picked up by bot. And they're being taken up to Mark's spaceship up here and loaded into a chest on this on the ship, I believe. Yes, here we go. Into this chest. It's a buffer chest. It's now got 14 of them. It's trying to fill up to 50, which is quite ambitious given how expensive those things are. But eventually it'll fill up and we'll and, and we'll be and then uh, Mike will be able to fly out in Mark's ship, to go out to somewhere where he can he can then launch his his um, Arcosphere launcher and start collecting the arcospheres and then uh, and I think he's, yes he's got the bits and pieces needed in here so he's got some some posh flooring um, a space probe rocket silo and some uh, pylon substations so that should be plenty to build that system up he can launch his uh, his launches arcosphere collectors get the arcospheres and then bring them back and then start working on the actual main part of the arcosphere puzzle so yep I think we'll uh, we'll leave him to get on with that one this does bring me rather neatly on to, hey look, Mark has made a massive great warship. Uh, so this is a thing that we've been, he's been working on for a little while, um, on and off for a couple of streams. Uh, and the idea of this ship is that it can be flown, it, it's, it's incredibly fast. It's got all of these um, antimatter engines across the back of it. Uh, and it generates all of its, well... It was originally designed to be a steam-powered spaceship that would fill up with steam from uh, from these pipes over here, and then with these tanks it would fly out and go to wherever um, and, and just run and run all of the lasers and things off the off the uh, off the steam power in, in the in these uh, in these tanks. And it was an interesting idea. Uh, Mark did some test runs with this. He flew out to Fenestra and back, and the run out to Fenestra used. Uh, 88,000 steam out of one of these tanks. So that was 44% of the amount of, uh, of of the amount of steam he had at that time because the ship was a little bit smaller when he was doing this. Um, and then he realised that, that that the reason he'd used up quite so much power was because we've got all these uh, laser artillery turrets on the ship and they use quite a lot of power. So he then re he then uh, removed those for the flight back and on the way back he used eight of the uh, 8,000 steam instead of eight, 88,000 steam. So literally an eleventh of the amount of steam. So um, And he made it safely both ways. So that just shows you how much power for the amount of damage these la laser artillery turrets use. So I think we... Um, the original plan was going to be to put in the uh, the add-on poles on all of the laser turrets, so they could be run separately from the uh, from the laser artillery turrets. Uh, unfortunately, that proved to be a, a, an absolute mess with uh, copper cables going everywhere. It just looked, it looked horrible, and it, it didn't work very well, uh, to be honest. So uh, Mark has now scrapped that idea. He's now put in a, an energy beam receiver on here with a with a heat exchanger here that can, and and a turbine generator, so we can produce um, 500 megawatts on the ship, which is easily enough to keep all of everything running on here. And so at the the idea of the ship is it can fly incredibly quickly to wherever it needs to go, and for the moment it's going to perhaps going to be used as an arcosphere collection ship. So it's not going to, the, all the weaponry on it is going to be a bit unnecessary. But in the long term, we intend to use it as a, as a sort of a beachhead establishing device. So this ship can fly out to a planet that is kind of bitery because um, and land on the planet. Then all of the weaponry, the artillery will, artillery will open up on the distant nests. The lasers around the outside will, will uh, shoot any biters that come running in. The uh, laser artillery turrets in the middle will shoot the biters from a bit further away. The idea is you can just drop this ship onto a hostile planet and it'll make then it'll pacify at least a big area of the planet really quite quickly, making it safe for an engineer to come running in and do whatever they need to. And this is going to be really, really useful later on in the game when we start needing to go out to dangerous planets to investigate the pyramids. And so having a ship like this that can just land and keep itself safe while the engineer wanders inside, does whatever they need to do and then can safely come back out again and they, they know the ship will be there, it'll be waiting for them, they can hop back in it and fly off and everything will be fine and dandy and safe. This is this is going to be very, very useful for us in the future, I think. At the moment it's a little bit overkill, but, you know, overkill's kind of fun, so, and, and, it, and it looks cool. It looks much better than the sort of the uh, the, the combat ship I started making in my in my previous run through, um, but then I didn't really finish that one. I, got, I just got, got distracted and went on to just finish the game in other ways instead. It also has a top speed of 173, which means it will probably be fast enough to do one of the uh, later um, deep space deep space science researches, where I think you need to put something on a spaceship and fly it around fairly quickly. I think we'll probably make a specialised uh, ship just to do that, though. Um, having running using this one for it seems like it seems a little bit wasteful because it's so big and cool. <laughs> 
It also has a massive rank bank of these antimatter booster tanks along the back here, and not only do those provide fuel for the engines when you're flying through space, they also allow the ship to take off, and Tristan's done a little bit of testing, and he informed us that this, this ship can take off from a Norvis-sized planet about nine times before it runs out of fuel. So that's going to be perfect for going out to distant uh, pyramids. You can fly in, you can do two or three planets and still have enough fuel to fly back again to refuel and bring everything back that you've uh, you've, you've acquired. So yeah, I think the ship is going to be really, really useful. Uh, we just don't need it quite yet. I've talked quite a bit in the past about um, how Mike has been out having adventures on Andragon and, and building up mines on every single ore patch he can spot and get his hands on. Uh, so it's new stuff today. Well, he's, he's been helped once again, he's been helpful and put tags on everything. I think he's being a little bit sarcastic with it because I know Mike, but uh, you know, it's actually, it's actually useful, so I won't mock too much. So over here, he's finished off his um, his chlorine production facility. So th these machines make chlorine and hydrogen. He doesn't want the hydrogen, so he's just blowing that off into the atmosphere. You presumably get a nice flame off that, or perhaps just a sort of a noise as the hydrogen goes up in flames. We shall we shall uh, we, we we won't see. I don't think I don't think we've we've got that level of detail in this game. <laughs> but that means he's now able to bring out the uh, chlorine round here to mine up the rare metals. And as I said last week, requiring rare me requiring chlorine to mine rare metals was a little bit of a surprise for us all. There's something else new under here. I can't tell what it is because there's a massive tag in the way. But if I zoom in a bit further. There we go. It turns out to be mineral water. I'll talk about that, that in a bit more detail in a little while though. Up here he's got a mess. Well this appears to be a combined uranium and stone mine and that does sound pretty horrific. I guess the way that works is that any drill that could possibly dig up some uranium is going to need to have some, is going to need to have acid in order to run. Uh, these ones over here are all just stone drills so they don't need the sulfuric acid. These ones over here as you can see are digging up both stone and uranium uh, which is, so they're going to, sometimes they're going to need acid, sometimes they're not. It's all a bit weird and a bit messy and, and, I, and I, I, this is why I've never done anything like this before. He's also got another um, rare metal mine pushing um, rare metal through the middle of this one so that's um, fine I suppose. All of this stuff is just going to be going to the same place in the end anyway and so in order to get that rare metal out yep there's another little um, chlorine production facility down here that's exactly the same as the other one. Makes perfect sense. Up here we have a combined oil and stone mine. Well, I guess that's what you, that's what happens when the patches get put this close together, and you decide even though these are patches of twenty-seven thousand and whatever this one is, uh, you, you want to get it all. You've got to got to dig it all up anyway. So yes, these are in here. We're digging up the uh, digging up the stone here. I presume there's a pipe taking the oil away, although I can't see one. If there isn't, that would explain why all the drills have stopped. Oh, here it goes. It goes over this way and then down here. Oh, over to this oil patch over here and then so it can bring, join onto the same pipe and bring it down here. Fair enough. That makes perfect sense. And yeah, that seems... I think that's all the new mines. Nope, he says he's put in a, a Vitamelange one somewhere as well. Maybe that's... There's a Vitamelange patch over there. I don't know. There's so much mining going on here and it's all sort of so... What, oh, maybe it's this one. Yes, here we go. That's Vitamelange green. So yeah, there's a little bit of a little bit of Vitamelange being dug up from over here as well. <laughs> it's, it's just ridiculous. I mean, on a, on a, any normal playthrough, you wouldn't bother de you wouldn't bother dealing with a, a patch that only has seventeen thousand Vitamelange in it. Um, but because he's decided he wants, he's going to go in and dig up every single little bit of absolutely everything. <laughs> All these little crappy patches like that one, and then there's a sort of some weird. There's eighty four thousand iron in a weird place up here, and and so on. All of that is going to need to be dealt with at some point, which is going to be. Uh, um, uh, interesting, I guess. And then there's another 68,000 coal over there. And yeah, lots of crappy little patches of goodness knows what that all, all need to be dug up and brought back to the central, uh, central trainermatron to be taken up into space and dealt with appropriately. And having all of that stuff coming through here did cause some un slightly unexpected problems. So it's being brought up in the train. There's lots of lots of lots of different resources, as you can see. We've got well, yeah, var various different things, and they're all being chucked into the warehouses over here. And then we've got the inserters across here that then load into the spaceship. Uh, the thing is, though, these inserters can only have four items on their whitelist, and the system managed to get into a silly position where these chests were full of barrels, I think it was, because that meant they were rel they were full, but there was a relatively low number of them, and then there was a load of other stuff in here. And the filters on these inserters pick the four things that there are the most of, I believe. Someone will correct me if I'm wrong, I'm sure. So if these warehouses were full of barrels, but then there was a load of stone, rare metals, coal, and... I don't know, iron ore in here, um, and there was more of any of those than there were of the barrels up here, then that could cause these inserters to not be able to unload anything out of these out of these warehouses because they're filtered on the stuff that's in this warehouse instead of the stuff that's in this warehouse. 
Maybe that means they should be disconnected, maybe it doesn't, I don't know. But fortunately, um, the sh the, there was only two of them that had jammed up like that. The third one was still running, and that was able to put enough of something into the ship that the that the, uh, the the priorities or the, the levels changed enough that the rest of it did start working. So it, it was a problem that did solve itself in the end, but quite easily could have not solved itself. So um, there was a, a lucky escape there. A similar problem was ha was caused over at the other side. So again, once again over here, you can see this warehouse is now completely full of barrels. However, a warehouse that's completely full of barrels only has 5,000 items in it. And previously, all of these disposal stations were set to trigger when there was a significantly larger amount of stuff in the warehouse because we wanted to make sure that the train would always fill up. We now, for this particular one, we seem to now be watching for more than 500 items in, in the chest and then turning the station on there because, well, that's enough. To, if it's barrels, that's enough to fill a train. And if it's not, well, the train will sit there and go, well, I've run out of stuff to pick up and clear off again. So it's probably going to be fine, but it is a, it is a little bit silly. Um, <laughs> but yeah, that's the problem with barrels only stacking up to 10 I guess so there's a uh, we, we you can't you can't unfortunately you can't currently check how many stacks of stuff there are in a station that's going to be a feature that comes out in Factorio 2.0 in most of a year and by then well we'll have stopped doing playing with the system we'll have done some, we'll have made something even even more crazy and over, oversized and even more complicated I expect so um Cell -V. But Tristan was able to send some more trains in, fiddle with the numbers there, and it got it running again. Down on Norvis, Mike is proud to say it. He's now finished this uh, system over here. He's got all of the all of the resources he's bringing in from Andragon. All of the no, all of the weird resources that he's bringing in from Andragon are now being processed in this area. So the Vitamalange is being dealt with here, the Immersite down here, and the Cranite in the middle. And I don't think any of the other exotic resources are being generated on that planet. So that should be sufficient. Everything else can just be ch chucked over into the normal core processing system. And this has been finished off by having having trains take all the, all, of the, all the different things away. He's got a train up set up here that he's going to take away the, the Vitamalange things and those are only being brought just to down, down to here where they can then be passed over to another tr space train and this will take them back up into Norbit where they will be dropped off here just above the uh, the Big Rid spaceport. And the idea of this is that he can then pour all of those outputs down here and into the in, into the warehouses for, along with all of the rest of the Vita stuff that's being brought over from Big Rid. So Essentially, it's going to be because none of the Vita anythings are being used down on Norvis. It's had to be brought back up here, but because they're all being used in funny places, and it's, it's, it'd be difficult to unload them accurately to the place, right places where they're needed. He's just brought them to the source, so they're being they're being put into here, and then and they're being counted in by this cable over here. I I hope no, they, they will be. So they'll be counted in as they go into here, and they'll just be added to the amount of to the, all, all the uh, levels of resources that are already over here in in, uh, in in Norbit, and then can be taken away by the train to wherever they're needed. Hopefully, he won't be bringing enough stuff up here to cause any problems or any jams. Now, I noticed there is already a certain amount of the uh, of the vitalic uh, vitamalange spice in the in the chest up here. There's still a bit of room, and there's still also quite a lot of room in the warehouse. But it might be worth putting some sort of thing on here to stop it loading when the vita spice is above an amount. I'm not sure. It's it's a, it's a little bit of a concern that in theory. If Mike brings up too much Vita Spice, it could fill this warehouse up completely and then block it from allowing the Vitalic Reagent through, which is the one that we need in enormous quantities, to send it over for the Naquium processing. So I'd, I'd, I'd rather that didn't break. So I think I'm going to suggest that he puts in a limiter on there that watches this warehouse, and if there's more than a certain amount, maybe a couple, of, a few thousand um, of, of the spice in here, then it'll stop running. That processing facility being finished off means that Tristan has now been able to export all of the uh, all of the uh, Vitamalange that was being accidentally brought over to the core processing area before we decided how we wanted to set all of this up, and he's been able to ship that off from here back over to where it belongs and where it can be processed in in uh, Mike's new facility. Now that's basically done. There's just a train over here that has just over 500 um, pieces of it, so we'll probably send that one over at some point just to just to, just to tidy it all up, clear it out, and, and make sure everything is uh, is neat and tidy. And so that brings the Andrigan processing system to, to its sort of conclusion. It is now, the processing is now all finished. The mining is working. Now, there's there's lots more patches that will need additional mines putting on them in order if the, if he's ever is actually going to completely clear this planet. But for now, I mean, it, 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 it's ticking over as it is. We'll see how much these, uh, these patches go down by, how long it takes to actually pull them all through. This iron patch has shrunk quite a lot, actually. I don't know how much, it, how much iron there was in it initially, but it was clearly at least this sort of size when it, uh, when it started, because there are a lot of extra drills in there. 
the same goes for this uranium patch over here. So, yeah, I mean, he's make, definitely making some inroads on them. Um, it just remains to be seen how long it's going to take to, to mine up absolutely everything on this planet. And whether we actually, whether that actually happens by the time we finish the game. Uh, and, well, yeah, just, just just how long it takes, basically. And whether we, need, whether we actually need that much stone. It'll be fun to find out. Down on Norvis, Marcus started working toward bioweapons, which is um, interesting. And the most important and interesting part of this is making these um, anti-creep virus capsules in the, uh, and then the anti-biter anti virus capsules. I keep wanting to call them antivirus, but no, they're not, that's not what they are. Uh, and these, these can allow you, these are supposed to be, well, they're supposed to be very effective poison against biters. It'll be interesting to see how well they work. And I believe they also ha reduce um, if evolution to an extent. So there you go. So it says, it says down there, Cull a significant portion of the biter population also damages biter DNA, regressing them into a less dangerous form. So if we start chucking these around, we might find that a lot of the biters turn into significantly smaller and less deadly uh, creatures, which would be quite exciting. Uh, this does require quite a lot of, well, stuff, as you can see here. We're making uh, ammonia to make nitric acid over here to make to make these ones, along with, what are you making? You're making bio, oh, biomethanol. This is, this is reminding me of the free power system we used to have. Then over here, we're making sand to make uh, chlorine and, and, and hydrogen to make hydrogen chloride to go into this machine. Uh, we're also need to, we also need to make the poison capsules, which are things you can presumably chuck at biters to, to sort of hurt them a little bit. Yes, they they create a bit of a poison cloud, or you can upgrade them to create the 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 virus, which does uh, massive damage to biter creep and also prevents more from generating. I don't know how useful that is. The creep doesn't seem to have been too much of a problem for us. But these require also require other things to be brought in as well. So we've got the genetic data over here, along and um, and imosite powder. So those are being brought in by a robot, which uh, again, as usual, I disapprove of somewhat, but. It, it is hopefully relatively small quantities, and the the um, and the genetic data is coming down from space as well, which makes it even harder to get hold of. Uh, so Tristan put in a system to get to get that loaded into the trains, uh, monitoring the um, monitoring the logistics network and sending it down whenever there's less than I don't know twenty of it down on the planet or something like that. So this will get loaded into here to, to make the uh, to make the capsules. Making the anti-biter viruses seems to require the these uh, the spitter and and uh, biter uh, capsules. Turns out these are being made up in Norbit because they require all kinds of biological stuff, or at least all kinds of Vita stuff. And so, whew, what's going on here? Right, so we're making the uh, we're making the small spitters, which is bio, requires biomass, vitalic acid, and nutrient gel, to make the medium spitters, which is the small ones and some vitalic reagent and more nutrient gel, to make the large ones, which requires the vitalic epoxy and the uh, unit and, and the uh, and the mediums and, the, and some more nutrient gel. And these things make capsules you could throw out, and a, and a biter or a spitter will come out of it, and it's a friendly one that will fight on your side. Uh, we each, we all started off with one of the with one of the large ones, I think, a sort of the um, a friend in a box, and we got a couple of them out. I don't know where they are. They're probably somewhere in our factory down on the surface, uh, just wandering around um, looking for something to nibble on that isn't that, that isn't ours. Uh, so we, these are all being made up here, and then they can be shipped down to the surface. The, these large ones can then be shipped down to the surface in order to be turned into the in, into the antibiotic virus capsules that you, you saw earlier. Uh, so this is all being done up here on in, in, in the top of the biological area because it's where all the all the Vita stuff happens to be, and this is just a lot easier than shipping it down on down planet side, uh, uh, especially as we need the uh, the bio samples to make the first stage of them, and these are only being made up here. And so I uh, yeah I, I kind of look forward to trying these ones out. Um, hopefully may maybe we'll try them in the next stream. So make sure you come along on Monday to uh, to join in and and uh, and, ha and watch and see see what sort of uh, nonsense happens when we start chucking these things around, because um, <laughs> there are still quite a lot of biters left on uh, on Norvis. So we'll be going out and fighting them at some point. And yes, yeah, speaking of speaking of going out and fighting the biters, well, if we turn if we turn that on and that on, uh, not that one and that on, you can see that Tristan has been continuing his expansion across here. He's pushing out pushing out a little bit further. He says he was out to about here where this radar column is um, at, the be at the beginning of the stream. And now, as you can see, he's pushed out all, all of these lines are pushed out a bit further. They're sl absolutely slaughtering the biters. Down here, he's actually found the edge of the planet, uh, so well done there. I think actually, no, I think he'd already done that sort of manually. But all the way up here, he's been pushing these ones out from about here to about here in the last stream. So, yeah, he's make it definitely making progress, um, and we'll <laughs> it, it, at this rate in about three months, three or four months' time, maybe we'll have all of Norvis completely made completely safe. <laughs> we shall see.
He does also say that he's found some nice choke points now, so he's been able to reduce the number of laser turrets, or the m number of laser artilleries he's got out there. So let's turn that back off again for a moment. So you can see round here, there's a sort of a solid wall of them across here, because he hasn't, he hasn't gone off to choke points in the south yet. But up here, he's got some in here, and then he's got some across here. And then there's a gap in them here, because he doesn't need them anymore, because the biters can't get through, because there's lasers down here. And then another blob of them across here, and then, yeah, then it gets a bit more solid as we come back around the top here. So, yeah, some expansion going on. It's... It's in progress. Eventually, we'll, yeah, as I say, eventually we will have all of Norvis, probably. Um, but it's, uh, I think this is one of those things where he's spending a little bit of time at the beginning or the end of each stream, putting down some, um, putting down some, uh, robot, some, some construction planners. The bots will fly out, put down some more turrets, kill some more biters, and then he can come down an hour later and tell them to do another, another chunk of it and another chunk, and then maybe remove some of the, uh, the laser artillery turrets from the back end of it as well. So it's a sort of a, an AFK expansion, as it were. <laughs> And as I said at the start of yesterday's video, there seems to be rather a lot for me to talk about this week. Um, I've been going going on about uh, uh, on for uh, quite a long time already uh, in, in this video as well. So I think I'm going to put in another cut here, and this can be a three-video week, uh, aren't you? <laughs> aren't you lucky getting all this content from me? Uh, so as ever, thank you very much for watching. I shall be uh, back with another video with the third and final part of this tomorrow, and then on Monday we'll be back with the uh, the next K2SE stream where we'll be carrying on with all the things we've been talking about. Uh, Mike will be doing more. Arcosphere stuff. Maybe I'll actually go out and capture some. I think he should be able to because he's got all the stuff he needs now. He's got the collectors. He's got the uh, the launchers. He can he can fly out and he's got the uh, the oh, massively over weaponed spaceship, so he can fly off into deep space, go and pick up some Arcospheres from here, there, and everywhere. Uh, then he can start working on the puzzle part of it. Tristan can carry on the expansions here, and as I said, we'll be looking into the the updates and uh, finding out what's been broken with that. Uh, and I should be crying over some lost spaceships. So uh, yeah, that'll be that'll be worth seeing. Come back on on Monday for that, and then on Wednesday for the uh, for the satisfactory stream where I should be messing around with trains some more in there and building out a new and neater and less ridiculous, well, no, probably more ridiculous, but more, also more organised uh, construction, construction system to build all the things that the space elevator is demanding at the moment. So there's lots of stuff in there to, to do. And, of course, I'll be back next weekend with all the usual videos. So make sure you subscribe so you don't miss out on any of that. Thanks very much for watching, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.